Habits and Health, episode 53. Welcome to the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of Habits and Health. And my guest today is Sarah Tate, who had a mental health breakdown a few years ago that completely changed her life. And we talked to her. She tells about how, what led to it in the first place and then the transformation she's had since that incident happened. So we'll be speaking with Sarah in just a minute. And if you know anyone who could really benefit from some of the great advice that Sarah shares with us in this episode, please do share the episode with them and hope you enjoy this week's show. Habits and Health, my guest today is Sarah Tate. How are you, Sarah? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty well. We're in Essex today. We are, yes. Chelmsford in Essex. And how, how is Essex today? It, it had a beautiful sunrise this morning, but it's turned out quite grey. <laughs> and so what is your, I mean, we, we, we spoke briefly before the show started recording and obviously, you know, we've been co- corresponding for a while. So you, you were telling me about you had an episode a, a couple of years ago. Would you like to so let our listeners know some more about you and your story and why, why it is that you're on a mission, I suppose, to inform people? Yeah, of course. So I was always the strong friend. I have always been a born planner, um, a perfectionist, wanting to please everyone, take everything on. And I got married in 2018 and the wedding was beautiful um, loved every minute of it. And after the wedding, I felt like I'd lost a sense of purpose and wasn't really sure what to do with myself and had been planning this dream wedding for ages. And I decided the best thing to do would be to throw myself into work, which in hindsight was not the best thing to do. Um, and I worked ridiculous hours. I worked really long days. I worked weekends. And then it came to the new year. And just, just to interrupt, when you said you threw yourself into work, was that your own self-employed job or working for someone else? This is working in a corporate finance job, right. yeah. So working in the city in London, um, working for a bank in the finance sector. And I... It was my own choice to take on a big project and my own choice to work the hours I was working because I wanted to throw myself into something because I guess I felt like I'd lost a sense of purpose and then was trying to get that back through work, Mm. which was definitely not the best thing to do. Um, And it came to January. So we got married in the June. I then had no time off over Christmas because I'd taken quite a lot of holiday for the wedding. So we got married in Italy. And I started January with a fresh outlook and did the whole new year, new me. Everything needs to change this year and I'm going to put myself on a really strict diet and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to do all of these things that are going to help me. And it's as if my brain just went, no, you physically can't take any more on. There's no more that we can physically do. And I felt my brain pop. So it's a physical popping sensation in my brain. And I collapsed into my husband's arms that evening. And I then had what is called now known, I didn't realize at the time, but I had what is called a psychotic episode. Mm -hmm. So throughout a couple of weeks of being really quite unwell, I believed things that nobody else believed. I thought my flat was bugged. I thought the TV was talking to me. I thought I was in a coma and that my mum and my husband were my physical, my mental health. And I had to complete challenges to be able to get out of the coma. I thought that the TV was round the wrong way. The, the, the way that I was watching programs, everything was in the wrong order. I would write consistently. It was like everything was trying to come out that had been stored in for the last 30 years of my life. And it was very scary. And I guess I'm here. And the reason I want to share my story and talk on podcasts is because I was the person that thought that it would never happen to me. Um, I was the one that was like, 
I'll always be okay. I don't need to worry about any of that. And it did happen to me. So I guess that's why I'm really passionate about sharing that I think whilst there's still this really big stigma around mental health and we're getting better, there's still a long way to go. And I think the more people that talk and the more people that talk about mental illnesses that aren't talked about as much, so things like psychosis, the more we can break down the stigmas even more and get to a place where we know that it is actually okay to not be okay and know that we can grow through the things that we go through as well, which I think is really important. So so from when uh, those incidents first started happening, and obviously you must have been pretty confused and and also your your husband and your mum and so on so what happened from there and so I'm guessing there was some kind of medical assistance and so on so how were they able to diagnose it pretty quickly I mean what happened then yeah so I am I'm really lucky that I've got private medical cover with my employer and I know that some people don't have that privilege and that luxury and I know that I'm very lucky to be able to have that and thankfully, I was able to get a appointment with a psychiatrist within three days. It was the weekend, so I couldn't be seen until the Tuesday. Mm. But as soon as I, as soon as the psychiatrist saw me, he diagnosed me with something called hypermania, uh, which is a milder form of psychosis. And then I got progressively worse. So when I went back to the um, psychiatrist after, he wanted to at that point section me. Mm. Um, I was quite aware of going to a mental health hospital. I didn't think there was anything wrong with my mental health at this point. I truly believed everything I was thinking and feeling was gospel. It was true. Mm. I didn't think that it was a mental illness that I had. Um, And my husband, thankfully, was aware that I was aware of the fact that I didn't want to go into a mental health hospital. And I, I remember Kit saying, don't put me in a padded cell, because that's what you see on the TV. So you think that if you're mentally unwell, you might get put in a padded cell. And that's how it came out. So my husband said to the, to the psychiatrist, like, please, let's not section her. Let me try and treat her at home. Mm. And he thankfully did. And him and my mum looked after me at home. I was able to then fully recover with the medication at home and thankfully didn't end up being sectioned, but I could have been. And I think that's quite scary that I could have been. Mm. And I'm very grateful to the fact that I had private medical, that I got the diagnosis, that I was able to be treated quickly enough with the right medication that Mm. I was then able to take at home. And I then got diagnosed at a later point that it was a psychotic episode because it was, it had not happened before. I had not struggled with any mental illnesses before and therefore it was classed as an episode rather than any longer term mental illness because of the way I was able to recover from the correct diagnosis and the correct treatment. And I then went on to have lots of therapy. I had one-to-one therapy. I had group therapy And I was able to then come off, gradually off of my medication and then discharge from my therapy. So all in all, I think the the journey of being from the the night my brain physically popped Mm. to being discharged from therapy was about 10 months. And just just to go, you mentioned one of the things you said a few minutes ago was you were very thankful that you weren't... uh, Sectioned. Sectioned, that's the word I was looking for. You were very thankful that you weren't sectioned. Were you aware at the time that that was a possibility? Yes. Right. And it's interesting because I I didn't think there was anything wrong with me Mm. mentally. I Mm. thought I had a brain tumour because my brain popped and I then went, well, I've got a brain tumour. Something I physically felt something happen in my brain therefore something must have happened to my brain physically Mm. rather than mentally Mm. so that was my initial reaction I need to go to a hospital as in a physical health hospital not a mental health hospital because there's something physically wrong with my brain and I then wouldn't sleep because I was so scared to sleep that if I slept I wouldn't wake up because I'd convinced myself I had a brain tumor Mm. 
Right. So then it got progressively worse because I wasn't sleeping. So mm. my mental health was then deteriorating even more because I wasn't sleeping. And it was just getting worse, which was making me even more paranoid and even more anxious about the fact that I had a brain tumour. And then I felt like I had every other illness that I've ever heard of in my life all within five days. So I remember right. first going to the NHS doctor because I had to get a referral to the psychiatrist and shouting at the doctor in the NHS, like in the surgery, saying, I am dying, like you need to help me, I am dying. And I can remember now her being like, it's okay. And I'm like, no, you don't understand, I'm dying. Like I physically felt my brain pop, you don't understand. And she obviously they can't tell you you're not dying because they don't know. So they sent me for blood tests. Um, and I remember getting the, the results of the blood test. And my husband was like, your blood tests have come back. It's absolutely, it's absolutely fine. I'm like, it's wrong. It's wrong. The blood tests are wrong. So I, I knew that there was something wrong with me, but I didn't think it was anything to do with my mental health. Mm. And I think then I started to realise, as we were going towards the mental health hospital, I we drove past the physical health hospital. And I was like, why, why are we going past that hospital? That's where I need to be. And we drove towards the mental health hospital. And I had the worst panic attack of, I am not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be at the mental health hospital you're going to put me in a padded cell and there's nothing wrong with me. I need to be in a hospital bed. Mm. And I think that's where it then, so it's like I knew there was something wrong, but I couldn't associate it being my mental health. I thought it was physically my brain. Mm. So therefore, once you started having regular sessions with the what psychotherapist, psychiatrist, whoever it was, did you feel like any kind of stigma? or How, how did you feel about that? I think once I'd had, I, I would say that my episode lasted a couple of weeks. Mm. So from the point where I was, I felt my brain physically pop to be able to actually have a conversation, be able to make my own choices, to remember who I was. Because there was points throughout that two weeks where I didn't know who I was. I was like, am I male? Am I female? like who am I I had to I had a candle at one point with my initial s on it in front of the tv to remind myself of my name Mm -hmm. and because I couldn't make decisions for myself and I couldn't think for myself even the thought of like my mum or my husband asking me what I wanted for dinner was too overwhelming like I couldn't make that decision unless something was physically put in front of my face and I was able to decide that one or that one I couldn't think it was too much to think Mm -hmm. um so I, once I'd been diagnosed, it was easier for me to be able to then say, okay, so how do I now get better? Now I know, and, and once the medication kicked in, it brought me right back down. Um, and I mean, it brought me down so much to the point where I remember having my a plate of food in front of me and my knife and fork. And it must have taken me about five minutes to get the fork into the bit of food to get it into my mouth because it's like everything in my brain was like on slow motion because it had, it had just brought me down so much where I'd been almost so high with the hypermania psychosis and it brought me right down. So I am... Um, remember thinking at that point well at least we know the medication's working but will I actually ever be able to have a normal life again where I can physically function and make my own decisions and eat my food at a normal pace Um, and I think once we got through all of that that couple of weeks once I came out the other side of that all I wanted to do was just make sure it didn't happen again so I was up for anything I was like give me all the treatment give me all the therapy let me work out why this happened let me work out how I can make sure it doesn't happen again so I think that was really important and I think at that point I didn't really even associate the stigma because I was so determined to get better and to make sure it didn't happen again and so you said, I think you said it was about 10 months. And so at what point did you think, yeah, I'm back to, I hesitate to use the word normal, but yeah, I'm feeling okay again. Yeah, that's funny, that word normal, isn't it? Because 
I think um I think probably after a couple of months I was able to do normal things in society again like meet friends spend time with family like be in a crowded room with people which was that first couple of weeks there's no way I could have done that that would have been pan- I would have had so many panic attacks about that So I think I got to the point after a couple of months where I was able to start seeing people again. I mean, I think even after three weeks, I went to the theatre with my husband because we had tickets booked. I think it was only three weeks after it happened. But I remember being very overwhelmed and all of the lights flashing really brightly and it being a lot. So I do remember that. Um, I think... It's funny because I look back on points now and I remember at that point thinking I was sort of, I was sort of good there. But then I look back now and I'm like, but I'm so much better now. Mm-hmm. So it, it's interesting. I remember when I went back to work. So I actually went back to work whilst I was still having therapy. So I went back to work after six months off on a phased return. And I remember my first day back at work. And I was like, I've come so far. Like, I'm back at work. This is amazing. Like, I'm being able to function in society again. I'm actually back the first day of the job. But then I also remember hearing somebody on a phone call and them talking to a group of people and sitting there thinking, I'm never going to be able to do that again. I'm never going to be able to speak to a group of people on a conference call which before was, I would do it five, six times a day. And then I remember walking in and thinking, I'm never going to be able to do that again. And then it wasn't until a year later um, that I was then doing a conference call in front of like hundreds of people sharing my actual mental health journey. And then I thought that day, wow, look how far I've come. Hmm. And then I fast forward to now and I've done an NLP qualification, so neuro-linguistic programming. I've set up a coaching business to help other people. And I'm now speaking on podcasts. And now I think, look how far I've come. So I think it's really interesting that it is. And I, I, I hate to use the word journey, but there's nothing else that describes it in the way that journey does. Yeah. Because it is. And I feel as though I'm continuously growing and continuously peeling back the onion layers of what else I need to to work through because I was that way for 30 years of my life and actually around that time is where it all came to head and then lots of things got untangled as I worked through it through therapy and then understanding myself more and now it's almost like a habit in itself of self-development and getting to know yourself on a deeper level and understanding why you do the things you do so it's almost just continued from that point and you mentioned one of the things that you were determined to do was you really wanted to find out why it happened so you, it wouldn't happen again. So what what do you think were the reasons? I mean, you mentioned about the, the pressure of the wedding and, and so on. Was, it, was there other things that contributed to it? I have always been a perfectionist. I've always liked things a certain way. I've always been a people pleaser, taken on everyone else's I hate to use the word problems, but everyone else's. Oh, what's the right word? I've I've always been a people pleaser and I've always thought I want to help as many people as I can. But by doing that, I wasn't helping myself. So Mm. I think what happened is through therapy, I was able to have a real stark reality of actually, if I continue to one, work in the same way that I worked previously, work really long hours, which again was all about seeking approval and wanting to do really well in the workplace and wanting to be a perfectionist and keep on top of my emails. If I continued to do that, then it's only going to end again in the same way. Or I would have been that person that when they retired, they dropped down dead because they weren't quite sure their body couldn't cope without the amount of work that they were doing. Yeah. So there was lots of unhealthy habits and behaviours that I had that led up to that point. And a lot of it, I think, now I know about NLP, I know that most of the way that you view the world and most of your habits and behaviours actually come from a lot younger on in life. And I think I had a great childhood, 
And I was the only child in the family for five years. And I had the unbelievable amount of praise and you're amazing and you're great at this and you're going to do really well in life and you're going to succeed. You'll always do really well. And it's almost as if that shapes your character. So you then take that through the rest of your life. And I think people sometimes think, well, if people have got problems in later life, maybe they had a bad childhood. It's not about that. I think it's about how you were conditioned. And I was almost conditioned to be, well, she's so great at everything and she's so good at this. It's like I had to live up to it. So I then continued the rest of my life trying to live up to this expectation of myself of, well, that if I do that, I get really good praise. So I need to make sure I'm then seeking approval and doing a really good job and nothing was ever really good enough for, for me, not for others. Right. And it was these really high expectations that I set myself that all of a sudden it was almost like a, a, I had to put the brakes on and it was like it all came at once. And it was like you either carry on doing what you were doing and carry on in that same cycle or you decide to learn some new habits and behaviors and learn a new way of living and have a different outlook on life so that that never happens again. And what you've just described, I'm guessing that you're familiar with the uh, growth mindset and fixed mindset. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of what you just said is uh, kind of feeds into all of that as well. Isn't it? Oh, my mindset was so fixed, so mm. fixed on need to be the best, need to do the best, need to need to keep continuing being the best and things like that. And it's just, yeah, it's it wasn't a healthy way to live. And mm. it created lots of different behaviors around food, around the way I viewed my myself physically, the way I actually looked after myself, the relationships I had with people. It's almost as if this, there was like that was one person up until that point where I had my psychotic episode. Right. And then I was able to grow and use the growth mindset to actually continuously develop. So I am by no means perfect and I still have bad days and I still have a lot of triggers. But what I do now is I work through them. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Where did that one come from? Why do I do that? And I I actually now find it like I find it fascinating why something might trigger me. You know, something that's just occurred to me as I'm listening to you speak, and I've never, never thought of this before, that in many ways it sounds to me, I mean, you, you give me your take in a minute, but it sounds to me, Ment- from a mental health perspective, you're in a much healthier place than you were before the incident happened. Absolutely. And so it took that incident to actually improve your mental health. And yeah. so many people have the perspective maybe who've never had any kind of mental health issues. And so therefore they think they're absolutely fine from a mental health mm-hmm. perspective. But your proof that actually by having a mental health issue, you can improve your mental health. Absolutely. Yeah, I I think all I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe that was meant to happen to me because it had to stop me in my tracks. And as horrible as it was for it to happen and for those around me, it is like I needed something really big to happen to Mm. take me on a completely different road. It's like it needed to divert me to say, if you carry on doing that. Yeah. It's only going to end in one way. So you need to change perspective. You need to change the things that you do in your life. You need to start looking after yourself. And by doing that, you'll then be able to continuously grow and develop. And you will be able to have a much better relationship with yourself and a much better relationship with your mental health and the way you look after yourself. So, yeah, absolutely. I actually wouldn't change it happening. So as horrible as it was for it to happen... Yeah. I wouldn't change it. I'm yeah. not advocating that everybody goes through it to yeah. get to a better place because there's definitely other ways. Yeah. But I think that having been through that has brought me to where I'm supposed to be today. And right. that is a much healthier outlook on life, a, like a growth mindset, like we were saying, and being able to help others, which I think is really important. Well, so in that helping others, I mean, you, you touched upon NLP. So how, how did you discover NLP and what happened? It sort of just fell into my lap. It was really, it was really um, amazing. I, um, when I recovered and was signed off of my therapy, I had a bug for self-improvement, self-development. I set up an Instagram page to share my journey. 
people naturally gravitated towards me and was asking me things about it. And because I've always been quite an open person, I was very open with what had happened to me. So if anyone asked, I would be very open about it. And I think what happened is people started then asking me for advice. The only advice I had was the advice I learned in therapy, which was great, but it was no qualification or training or anything like that. So I knew I wanted to do something, but I wasn't sure what it was. Mm -hmm. And I was on a conference call at work and we have lots of development sessions at work. And one of my friends that was also on the conference call messaged me and said, that book they're talking about, I'm actually in that book. And I was like, wow, okay, why are you in that book? And she said, when I did my NLP training, I got featured in that book. And I was like, what's NLP? She was like, oh my God, Sarah, you would love it. And she explained it to me. And she said, there's this amazing company that I learned with. They run a two free day course. So go and try it for the first two days. If you like it, then you can continue. And I went for the first two days and I was like, this is where I'm meant to be. This is what I'm meant to be doing. This brings together everything that I believe to be true about mental health, about how people can grow through things. This is my path. This is my journey. This is where I'm meant to be. And then it's just gone from there. I did my practitioner training, uh, which is the, the first level. And then I did my master practitioner training, which included hypnotherapy as well, which is the, the um, top level of um, master practitioner NLP training. And then I, um, I could go on if I wanted to, to do trainer trainer, to train other people to do it. But I've decided at the moment that I'm really interested in helping people one-on-one. So I set up a coaching business in September last year and I've been helping people using NLP, which I find amazing. And not only do I absolutely love watching people grow and improve their current circumstances, I learn so much from my clients as well about me and about who I am as a person. So it's just, it's just great. I just absolutely love it. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe that creating healthy habits should be easy. If you know a friend or a loved one who might be interested in learning simple habits to improve their health, then please share this podcast with them. We also invite you to subscribe and to leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Now, back to the show. And so you... When did you, sort of the most recent course that you did, when was that last year, did you say? Yeah, so I did that last year. So I fully qualified at the end of July. And what, was there anything, I mean, I, there's probably a number of things that you learned about yourself doing that training, but what, what was the thing, is there anything that most surprised you, would you say? What I didn't know before I did NLP was about how everybody views the world completely differently. So we all view the world completely differently based on the experiences that we've been through. That seems quite obvious, but getting to the root of how that happens and how people build their maps of the world and then how they then filter information in from the external world internally and then make it mean something to them, that was fascinating. So I think what it did for me is even though through therapy I knew and I understood why I'd got to that point, I think what NLP did was help me really identify what my triggers were and why some of them were so strong, why some of them weren't as strong and why I did the things that I did even before therapy because I think at the time when I had therapy it was very much like survival I needed to work through those things that I needed to go through at that point to be able to function again in society whereas when I did NLP I was already fully functioning in society and I was able to then go even deeper and work out okay that makes sense that why I would be triggered by that because of something that had happened in my past and I was able to make all of those links back which in itself was fascinating right so since you've, well, the people you're working with now, so the clients you're working with, are they, is it, do, do you have like a niche of people who went through something similar to what you went through or is it more broad than that? 
I like to describe it as helping people before they get to the point I got to. Right. So if I think about all the things that I was doing pre my psychotic episode, the people pleasing, the trying to stay on top of everything, the trying to be everything to everyone, the not looking after myself, all of those things that contributed to me having the psychotic episode, they're the people that I like to try and help now so that they never get to that point. So I can almost like help divert them off the current path that they're on before it gets down that road. Right. Um, so generally the people I help are quite similar to myself pre-psychotic episode that are perfectionists, people pleasers, trying to do everything, got a to-do, constant to-do list in their heads, those types of people. So why would they come to you in the first place? What What is it that makes them think, I need to change something and then come to you in the first place. I'd like to think that it is they've seen what I've been through and therefore know that there's hope that no matter what they're going through or no matter what they're feeling, that they can come to somebody that can understand their current situation and move them from either out of that current situation or to a completely new new situation. So I think people always have in them something they want to change or somewhere they want to get to. And I think what, for me, NLP coaching does is just help enable that. So, if, so one question that's come into my mind, and it's kind of, I guess, two parts. So... People listening to this now may, how would they spot a close family member, a close friend, spouse who maybe has similar, who may, if they continue the way they are to have issues like that you've, you've mentioned, mentioned about, or, or how, how could they recognize it in themselves that they are going in that direction? Hmm. So I think some of the biggest warning signs for me, which I completely ignored, is I stopped doing anything I loved. So if you, you yourself or somebody you know has completely shut everybody out and stopped doing the things they loved and has almost retreated into themselves, that isn't to say that that's going to end up in psychosis, but that for me is a warning sign of somebody isn't quite right. And um, what, that, what, what would, what ex- excuses what what would they say as to why they're stopping doing things they enjoy what do you think they would be saying what kind of things trying to think of some of the things that I would have said I I just didn't I didn't make time for it's not about other people it's I didn't even make time for doing things for me all I was doing was working so I was throwing myself into work And I didn't allow any other space to be able to do the things I loved. So see the people that I love, do the things I love. So I think, I think some of the big things would be if people are shutting out people that they love in their lives or um, stopping doing the things they love in their life. And that could be a number of different excuses that they could use. They could say, work's too busy. I've got too much on. um, I'm really sorry, but I can't. And, This is the reason why I think the the big warning sign for me now is about if people are really overly apologetic about something and they are making lots of excuses. Um, And also, I think another warning sign is if someone's really struggling to make a choice over something, if it's a particularly if it's a small choice. So that for me was a big warning sign. I was really struggling to be able to think clearly and make a choice. Um, And I think now I would be able to recognize that in myself and probably others and say, everything feels quite full in your life. Maybe you need to take a time to have a bit of a breather from that fullness is what I would probably say. Right. And in in some of the communication we had before the recording, you mentioned about the relationship that that food and exercise and contributed to all of this. Yeah, so I had always been on a diet, (laughs) and yo-yo diet. So I would do like shake diets during the week, and then it would hit the weekend, and I would just eat takeaways all weekend. And I think that that was a form of control. I think because I was feeling out of control in other areas of my life, 
I think I knew I could find a way to control food. So food became something I could keep some sort of control over. If everything else felt like it was out of control, I knew I could control what I was putting into my body. But that wasn't in a healthy way. That was not eating enough during the week and then eating way too much at the weekend. So then I'd go, right, no, we need to stop. We need to start everything again. And it was like I was able to set the reset button on my food and the way I was eating. It was just really unhealthy. I would feel a lot of guilt around if I had anything that wasn't as nutritious as before. And I think now what I've done is just ditch the diets for good and just built a much better relationship with food and my body. And I think that I have, I think when you build up your self-esteem, when you go through something like that and you build back up your self-esteem and your self-worth, that actually just perpetuates into the rest of the environment. And that includes the way that you look physically and the way that you um, look after yourself, the things that you put in your body. The, when, when we talk about exercise, I think before I would have been really trying to hammer it in the gym Whereas now I'm much more relaxed about my approach to exercise. I think that if I fancy going to the gym, I'll go to the gym. If I want to go for a walk, I'll go for a walk. If I want to do yoga, I'll do yoga. And there isn't that pressure that I put on myself to be like, I must go to the gym five times a week and I must do this X, Y, Z workout because otherwise the world's going to fall apart if I don't do it. So I think that's the the difference now is that it was just – really unhealthy even the healthy things were made unhealthy because of the way I was doing them and so how have you so it sounds like from what you're saying you've improved your health in many aspects aspects obviously from the mental side but also from your nutrition and your exercise and so I wonder what have you implemented any any habits to to take care to improve the the way you're eating the way you're exercising and thinking and so on I think for me, the choices I make around eating and exercise come from the mindset that I've got. Because I know that if my head, if I've got a clear mind and I'm feeling more positive, I'm more likely to then nourish my body in a more positive way. Right. So for me, that all probably starts with my morning routine. Right. And I know that if I get up and I have a really good start to the day and my morning routine involves sitting and drinking a cup of tea in complete silence with no distractions and just thinking so that's really good to the first thing I do then I journal then I use affirmations visualizations gratitude I absolutely swear by um when when you talk about your journal and gratitude so is it a gratitude journal or is it just an aspect of the journaling so my journaling I do is just I just write. I find it really cathartic to just write. I think sometimes we can put too much pressure on ourselves of having a perfect journal and they're needing to be prompts and they're needing to be this. And Mm. I've got a notepad and I just write. I write the date at the top of it Mm. and then I just write how I'm feeling. Sometimes I'll write about the dreams I've had. Sometimes I'll write about the day ahead. Sometimes I'll write about something that happened yesterday. Just whatever is on my mind, I will just write about it. And it (laughs) You'll be surprised. You can write quite a lot when you're just doing that. So I find that fascinating. So that really sets me up really well for the day. And then I mean, my gratitude I do separately. And I'm sorry to keep in touch with you, but I'm just thinking, so on that journaling, so say today you write, I don't know, three pages, for example. Mm-hmm. Do you ever look back at it or is it just something to get out of your head? I don't often look back at it, no. Right. I think it's just at that point in time how I was feeling. I have looked back at it before, And I have seen, oh, um, that's how I was feeling that day. And I think if I look back at it too much, it's almost as if you're going back over old ground all the time. Whereas I think that's just how I was feeling at that point in time. So I was always going to feel that at that point in time. That's not how I feel today. That's going to be different. So I, I don't tend to go back over them. No, I tend to just write, get it out. And then my gratitude I do separately, which will be to set up my day with um, three things I'm grateful for. Um, If I don't have time to do the the gratitude, I will do it while I'm brushing my teeth. So I'll just think about it rather than write it down. So I'll always make sure that I get gratitude into my day-to-day routine. 
that for me helps to shift the brain to look for more positives. Mm. And then as you start doing that, you just seem to naturally feel more gratitude and more uh, more gratitude towards everything and more positive in general. So mm. I think gratitude is brilliant. Um, so I think it starts for me with my morning routine and then that almost goes in the rest of the day. If I then, if I've woke up and I've had that really nourishing time for myself in the morning, right. I then tend to nourish myself better throughout the day. Right. So that makes me wonder how... Can you remember, did you feel much gratitude before all of this happened? Did you have much gratitude to, towards things in general? I think before I was always chasing the next thing and never reflecting on the moment of what I actually had. Right. I think I always wanted more. And I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting more. But there is if you're not reflecting on actually what you've already got. Right. Because what you've already got is will take you to wherever else you want to go. And I think it's really important to stop, reflect, what have you currently got? What are you grateful for before then deciding what else you want or need in your life? And I think that's the difference. I think before I never stopped and it was always I wanted the perfect wedding. And then as soon as the wedding was over, it was like, right, well, what's next? Right. Whereas actually if I'd have taken time to be really grateful for the wedding right. and be in a space of gratitude, I might not have then felt that afterwards. I might not have then felt that there was such a what's next then. Right. My, my hunch is, it'd be interesting to see your thoughts on this. My hunch is I think the majority of people don't maybe – have as much gratitude for for their own the things that they have in their life and friends and family and so on but even more than that this very few people it seems to be are living in in a present and do reflect on on their life mm. and things that happen in, in their lives i think it's really hard to be completely in the present these days because of the amount of distractions we've got and i think it takes a lot of practice this mm -hmm. and it's something i continuously work on daily right. around practicing gratitude and being in the present moment i think the society that we live in nowadays there's distractions everywhere that take you away from the present moment and i really try to minimize those distractions as much as possible so i don't have any notifications on my phone so if i'm having a conversation with my husband I'll try and turn the TV off so there's no distractions there. There's no notifications that come on my phone so I can be fully present in that conversation. And it has to be worked on. Otherwise, it's just, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it is a daily practice, isn't it? I think very few conversations we have these days are distraction-free. And even if they're distraction-free, sometimes when we're having a conversation with someone, we're either anticipating what they might say next or thinking of your reaction to what they're going to say or thinking about something else as they're talking so very very rarely are we completely in the present moment and I think that's it does take practice it is a muscle that you need to practice you wouldn't expect to go into the gym and be able to pick up the heaviest weight first time round so you can't expect that you're going to be completely in the present every minute of every day it does take practice it is training your brain and meditation is really good for that um journaling is really good for it finding moments of mindfulness for me is really important um my days can be quite busy, so I think sometimes it's just taking a moment to sit on my sofa with a cup of tea, with my dog, and just being like, oh, let's just let all the thoughts settle, and let's just practice a bit of mindfulness in this moment. Actually, how does the taste, how, how does the tea taste, how, does, how hot is it, how warm is it, that sort of thing. So I think those little moments of mindfulness are really important to incorporate into your day to enable you to feel more grounded in the present. So if, if someone's listening to this and thinking, I am distracted all the time, I, I, I don't have focus, and, and they, they, they love what you've just said about how being more present, and what, what initial steps would you recommend people could take to maybe start to go towards that direction? I would work out what distracts you from the present moment. 
that's a really good place to start. So I know that my phone can be really distracting. So if you break down what is it that takes you away from the present moment, whether that be physically or your thoughts that you're having, that way you can then start to break down. Okay, so if it's my phone that distracts me from being in the present moment, what can I change about how I use my phone to ensure that it doesn't take me away from the present moment? Can I therefore have screen t- screen free days or screen free evenings? Can I change my, the way my notifications come up on my phone? Can I put my phone in a different room for half an hour? Like those sorts of things. And then I think around the thoughts, it's about journaling on them, I would say, is if there's repetitive thoughts that you're getting that are taking you away from the present moment just sit and write about them so that you can be present with those thoughts but what about me many people say that they've tried to journal and they do it for a couple of days and then it stops and then they try it again a few months later and it's not how could you give any tips for someone to make journaling a, a habitual thing that they do daily i think have you heard of the habit loop the habit loop yeah go on yeah I find that really interesting so habit loop is about the um initial trigger of the habit and then the um the action that you take and then the reward that you get out of the back of it Mm -hmm. so I think you there needs to be a reward for the habit because otherwise you're not going to stick to it so for me the reward for journaling is that it clears my mind So if I don't do it, I know that my mind feels more full. So it's then weighing up what's the benefit of it. So if you then know that the reward you get out of the back of it, that you get a clearer mind, for me, I would then question why would I not do it? Mm. So it's not a case of building in why you do it. It's why would you not do it? The other thing that's really good with habits is habit stacking. So attaching a habit to something you already do So if you already get up in the morning and maybe read the paper, you could have your journal next to the paper, which means that as soon as you open the paper, the next thing you know you do is then to journal or get out of bed and have your journal, um, your journal on top of your phone. So actually you pick up your journal first. So whatever your current habit is you have, adding it physically in, or like I said about when you're brushing your teeth, when you brush your teeth in the morning, adding in gratitude at that point as a habit so attaching habits to things that you already do throughout the day that are already you subconsciously do without even thinking about them that can be a really good way to make sure that they stay as a habit well we time is pushing on that Sarah so a couple of questions I always ask every guest before we finish is is there um is there a book that comes to mind that has really moved you in any way that that comes to mind quickly so the book that I have loved the most and I pick up every now and again is The Secret and that's all about the law of attraction and how what you put out is what you get back Mm -hmm. so it's about focusing on what actually is it that you want and then visualizing that and working towards that and that for me has been an amazing book that I've read that's opened up possibilities that I never thought could be true, but it really does prove the power of your mind. And if people want to find out more about you, your website, your social media and so on, where, where would they look? So I'm on Instagram at I am Sarah Tate and I'm on Facebook at I am Sarah Tate and, and on Facebook it comes out Sarah Tate coach and speaker. I'm working on my website at the moment, so that will be available in the next couple of months, and that will be saratape.co.uk. And and finally, Sarah, is there a quotation you particularly like? I love the quote by Henry Ford, which is, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And why does that speak to you? Because it just shows you the power of your mind. So if you believe that you can do something, you absolutely can. If you think you can't do it, you're also right. You probably won't be able to. So it just shows the power of your thoughts and how by believing in what you want and how you can get it, you absolutely can. Well, Sarah, thank you for your time. And it's been, been a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Next week is episode 54 with Tina McDermott. And she spent most of her life struggling with digestive issues and she didn't understand that the embarrassing gas and bloating and constipation and the yo-yo weight gain loss, all of that was connected. And so we discuss about how she discovered that and what she did and a lot more. So that's next week in episode 54 with Tina McDermott. If you know anyone who would get some value from some of the information that Sarah shared with us in this episode around mental health, please do share the episode with them. Hope you have a great week. Thanks for tuning in to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at tonywinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast. Thank you.